This is the next workshop in the 2023-2024 Seal of Biliteracy Professional Learning Series. My name is Candace Black and I'm your World Language Associate in the Office of Bilingual Education and World Languages of the New York State Education Department. Welcome to demystifying the end of year data submission for the New York State Seal of Biliteracy. At the end of each academic year, schools must report their seal data to OBEWL to obtain the seal stickers to put on the diplomas and the medallions to distribute to students for graduation. SEAL coordinators submit this information on what's called the end of year data form in the late spring or early summer. This sometimes arduous process of gathering and entering the data can be streamlined to ensure accurate and timely reporting, as well as to avoid overburdening the SEAL coordinator during an already busy time of year. Each part of the form will be unpacked while strategies for recording record keeping and cross checking data for errors will be discussed. In the second half of the webinar, participants will work in small breakout rooms to complete a challenge exercise designed to hone their skills in completing the end of year data form. There will be ample time for participants to ask questions. Before I introduce my co presenter, I'd like to thank Wing Xiao Zhang for her help in assisting with this webinar. I have the pleasure of presenting today with a colleague and a friend, Anna Stoops. Anna, would you please tell us a little bit about yourself and begin the webinar? Can you hear me okay? All right, good afternoon. My name is Anna Stooks. I am one of the professional development specialists at the Midwest Arburn in Rochester, New York. And also I am the regional coordinator for the Puerto Rican Hispanic Youth Leadership Institute. So I'm delighted to be here with you today to present on um, demystifying end of year form data. Um, our electronic handouts folder, you can access using this QR code or the short URL at the bottom. And all the materials shown in this presentation can also be accessed on the website. And you can simply type in NYSAD into Google and NYSFB to get the website. And I know for myself, it's easiest to bookmark it so I can click on it um, without having to type that in every time. Also to facilitate any questions that you may have throughout the session, please use the link. I believe it should be in the chat now um, for the question form. And um, if time permits, then we'll be able to field those questions today. Um, if not, it will become part of an FAQ. So we have quite a few goals for today. I'm gonna move my bar here so I can see them all. Um, so our first goal is I can find the end of year data form on the NYSSB website. I can identify the submission window for the end of year data form. I can explain the rationale behind the SEAL coordinator providing a copy of the end of year data form to the district data coordinator. I can explain the color coding of the end of year data form in terms of which cells must be filled out and which are auto-calculated. I can explain what the NYSSIS is and how I can obtain it. I can explain the four categories of eligible SEAL candidates. I can explain when an amended end-of-year data form must be submitted. I can explain how to use the error messages on the school information tab to identify and correct errors on the end of year data tab. I can explain the difference between anticipated and criteria already met. And I can determine if a student has met the criteria to earn the New York State Seal of Biliteracy based on a description of the criteria that students have completed by filling out a sample end of year data form. So these are all of the goals that we're going to accomplish today and let's get started. So this information and guidance in the webinar is presented for SEAL coordinators that submit the end of year data form directly to NYSED. 
which are district schools outside the New York City and all charter and non-public schools in the state. So um, if you are a field coordinator from a New York City public school, you may be wondering how will you benefit from this webinar? So you will benefit by understanding the criteria required to earn the seal of biliteracy and the data that is collected and how the form can be tracked, can be used to track the student progress. And also you may be wondering why is this different for New York City than charter and non-public schools across the state? And it's simply because the SEAL coordinators from the New York City public schools submit their end of year data to the Division of Multilingual Learners. And this specific office reviews and adds supplemental data to the New York State public schools end of year data forms before submitting it to NYSEN. Okay, so where can I get the end of year data form? The end of year data form is located on the New York State Seal of Biliteracy website, which we gave you at the beginning. Um, a simple Google search of NYSSB and EOY data will get you the correct web page. When is the submission window for the end of year data form? It is from May 5th through July 15th. So you have a pretty big window uh, to submit it and we'll explain a little bit more uh, why that is such a big window. So how can you determine the best submission date from within the window? Um, using backwards planning is the best approach. So take into consideration the date that the students graduate. So an example date could be June 21st. How long will it take the school staff to put the seals on the diplomas? So we'll go back one week. Allow two weeks for processing, end of year data form and mailing of seals and medallions. So now that's two weeks, now a total of um, three weeks prior to graduation. And your submission deadline would be approximately May 31st. How is the end of your data form submitted? So the end of your data form is an Excel workbook that is submitted to OBEWL as an email attachment to nyssb at nyssed.gov. It is not recommended to submit the form as a link as you are able to access it through the website. Um, this will cause delays. So submitting it as a workbook is the best way to submit the end of your data form. The data tracking process. First, you'd like to request data points um, on incoming seniors. So requesting data on New York State Seal of Literacy candidates. You'll need the nicest number, gender, graduation year, race, ethnicity, ELF status. You'll also want to use this information to recruit students. So requesting data on any of the criteria for English, or the world language that students may have already met. Um, using course averages for ELA 11, Checkpoint C world language, and exam scores for the ELA regions, NYSA slot, AP or IB, English or world language. Um, so requesting the nicest numbers from the data coordinator for the students pursuing the seal of biliteracy is an important aspect of the end of year data form that you will definitely need. Um, entering, the uh, entering the data on the end of year data form and use this to track student points. So these are just some nice visuals to be able to keep you on track in terms of the important data points that you will need for the end of your data form. 
and who is the best person that can provide this data could be a school counselor or the district data coordinator, especially for the nicest number that you will need for each student. Why should I share a copy of the end of year data form with my district data coordinator? This is important because um, SEAL coordinators will submit the end of year data forms again between that window of May 5th to July 15th. And many SEAL coordinators are 10 month employees, typically teachers who do not work in the summer. So if there is a discrepancy after the SEAL coordinator has finished work for the year, NYSED has to be able to have a contact um, that is familiar with the end of year data form to resolve the discrepancy in a timely manner. So there are two forms, two tabs, I'm sorry, on the end of year data form. The first tab is the school information tab. And the second tab is the end of year data tab. You can see down here at the bottom when you have the end of year data form pulled up. There is many wonderful, beautiful colors on the end of year data form. And the cells are shaded um, with a that are shaded with a color other than gray must be filled out by the seal coordinator. The gray cells are auto calculated fields, and so they can't actually be changed uh, by anyone in the form. The auto calculated fields in gray serve as a confirmation that the form has been filled out correctly. The other colors, orange represents the school and seal coordinator information. The lavender represents the electronic signature of the building administrator designee. The green represents the data summary and the pink is for the error codes. So we'll go through each of those colors um, to be able to understand how to complete the end of your data form best. The orange section of the school info tab, remember there are two tabs, so the school information tab, um, the orange, orange section um, you complete with the district name, school name, person with the medallion, who the medallion should be sent to, the address of the school, and as you see this here is in gray, so that will be auto calculated based on the information that is inputted to the end of year data form. Um, and then the date which the seals are needed. And remember using that backwards planning, that would be the date that you would submit there. So just to highlight again, um, this field auto calculates in the gray the total number of seals and medallions to be sent based on the information entered in the end of your data tab. Keep in mind that the number of seals to be sent are only for those who have met the criteria upon submission of the end of your data form. Any anticipated candidates will only receive their seals once they have completed all work toward the seal. So if you have any students who have not met all the criteria by the time you submit the form, then they will not be reflected in this gray area. Again, why do we ask the person completing this? I'm sorry. Why do we ask if the person completing this form will be available over the summer? And again, that's just to be able to address any discrepancies that may arise and uh, any follow-up information that may be needed uh, during the summer. And um, so it's important to have a school contact person who is available during the summer.
And also the person needs to have access to the final end of year data form. So um, when the data form is submitted, the data person or the person who's going to be using this information during the summertime needs to be included in that uh, messaging so that they can have the most up-to-date data form as well for their school or their district. All right, the lavender section of the school information tab, complete all blank cells shaded in lavender for electronic signature of building administrator designee. Generally, the building administrator designee who submits the form is the school coordinator. The signature indicates that the data in the end of year data form is accurate. A copy of the end of year data form has been sent to counselors and the district data coordinator, and the superintendent has been notified of the submission. So by completing this section, you're agreeing to all of these. Okay, the green section of the school information tab. There are no blank cells in this section. Gray fields automatically summarize data entered into the end of year data tab by various categories. For example, gender, graduation, age, race, ethnicity, else data. So these auto calculate. Use the auto calculate fields to double check your data. All genders should equal total seal candidates. All races and ethnicities should equal total seal candidates. And all else data should equal total seal candidates. Realizing and recognizing that current L's, former ever L's, never L's with a home language of English, never L's with a home language other than English. So pointing that out that L status can be confusing because you're thinking of English language learners. And in this end of year data form, it is also accounting for students who are never else and have a home language of English. So native English speakers. The data summary can be used by schools to quickly report information on SEAL candidates. Um, for example, for Board of Education presentations um, and just being able to quickly access that information um, at a glance. The pink section of the school information tabs is for the error codes displayed in the gray fields that auto calculate based on the data entered on the school information tab. So use the information displayed to correct entries before submitting the form. So we're gonna take a look at some errors. So here it says, does every student have a unique 10 digit NISIS number? And there is an error code presented. The error one is that NISIS does not have 10 digits. This is too few or too many digits. There are students with the exact same NISIS number. So this can be possible um, in different circumstances. So that's why it's important to double check that nicest number. The nicest number is typically different than a school ID number. A school ID number uh, is unique to the school district. The student's nicest number is unique to their state ID number. So they cannot be replicated um, so, for example, if a student from Brooklyn comes to Rochester, 
they will still have the same nicest number, but they could have a different school ID number from Brooklyn and a different school ID number in Rochester. So the solution would be to go back and verify the correct nicest numbers. And that's why it's important to have that relationship with the district data coordinator, because they will be able to access that nicest number as needed. Okay, I jumped ahead a little bit. <laughs> what is the nicest ID number? Okay, so uh, the nicest ID number is the unique 10 digit number assigned to each New York student, New York State student, um, pre K through 12, and it follows them from school to school. Um, and the district data coordinator um, uses this also for the seal of biliteracy earners, for NICE student information repository system or SIRS, um, and your school's internal student ID numbers are not the nicest, nicest, nicest ID number. So just wanted to clarify that point. From whom can I obtain the nicest ID numbers for SEAL candidates? The nicest numbers are generally not, not accessible by faculty and staff on the district or school student information system, like your Power School or Infinite Campus. Sometimes the nicest ID numbers um, can be obtained from the school counselors or building administrator, um, and certainly they can be obtained by the district data coordinator. Um, they are typically the only person who is able to access that number, um, and this is why schools are required to identify the school district data coordinator on the seal of biliteracy school notification form that's due on December 1st of every year. That way, there's not much of a scramble at this time of the school year when testing is happening and there's other activities going on that the district data coordinator may be needed for and um, might be a little more difficult to track them down. So uh, if you're able to get the nicest number for that December 1st submission, um, then it kind of helps you streamline the process for this time in the spring um, when the end of year data forms do. When should you request the nicest ID number for students pursue, pursuing the SEAL? Um, it's recommended for the SEAL coordinators to request the nicest number for all the SEAL candidates as soon as they commit to pursuing the SEAL. For example, it's June 1st. You need the seals and medallions in two weeks for graduation. The email, um, your email the, to the district data coordinator to request the nicest ID numbers um, comes back with a response of an away message. And the district data coordinator found that time of the year to be an opportunity to escape for a week or so. And won't actually be able to provide you with that information um, for a delayed period of time. And so graduation dates don't typically change. So it might be a little difficult to be able to get that information in the time that you need it. Okay, let's take a look at some errors here. A common error on this form is leaving a cell shaded in a color other than gray blank. These errors indicate that one or more students entered onto the form have a blank where data is required in the gender, race, or L status columns. In addition, every student must have a language other than English listed in the first green column. And I'm going to pause here and have Candy take over. Thank you, Anna. We're now going to move on to common pathways for world language students. On this screen, you can see our criteria document to earn the seal of biliteracy 
in which the first two columns reference the English criteria and the second to the world language criteria. For your convenience, we've highlighted in yellow the most common pathways for students who study a world language to complete the SEAL criteria. In yellow, we have our English criteria, which include an 80 or better on the Regents exam, completing 11th and 12th grade ELA courses with an 85 or better, and presenting a culminating project. In the same fashion, in the second set of columns, the most common pathway for these students to earn points towards a world language include 2A, completing a Checkpoint C world language course with an 85 or better, and 2E, presenting a project. We do have pathways that are exclusively reserved for L's and heritage speakers, as well as ones that are more likely to be completed by these groups of students. In the English side, we see that there are two areas that are exclusively reserved for English language learners. 1A, an English language learner can score a 75 or better on two Regents exams other than ELA without translation to earn a point. For 1B, ELS can also earn an overall score of 290 or better on the nicest slot exam that is taken during 9th to 12th grades. Please note that these two criteria are not available to students who are not English language learners. Now in 1D, we have a variety of English assessments that are available. There is one, however, that is only available for ELS, and that is the TOEFL exam, or the test of English as a foreign language. Again, students who are not ELS should not be taking these exams or this exam and should not be using that as a point towards the seal of biliteracy. On the world language side, there are two criteria that are generally only used by ELS or heritage speakers, and they include 2B, providing a transcript from school in a country outside the US showing at least three years of instruction in the student's home language in grade eight or beyond with an equivalent grade of B or better. Now it is possible for an English dominant student to study abroad for three years. It's just not very frequent. By the same token, 2C is for students enrolled in a bilingual education program, and they earn this point by getting an 85 or better in any HLA or home language arts coursework that's required. So let's move on to the second tab of the end of year data form, and that is the actual end of year data tab. You can see some screenshots in front of you, and you can also see the color coding where the white represents the student information, the blue is their demographic information, pink is their L status, brown is criteria met or anticipated, then you have a set of two tan sections. The first is your ELA criteria, the second is your world language, and your green column is to indicate the name of the world language. Let's investigate each of these sections separately. The white section of the EOI data tab are three columns that are for the student's first and last names and the internal student ID number. Now these columns are optional. They are only provided for the convenience of SEAL coordinators, as it's much easier for a SEAL coordinator to reference and enter the data for a student when they have something like the student's name, as opposed to a 10-digit number they may not be familiar with. We ask, however, that you protect student privacy, and before you submit this form to the state, that you delete those three white columns prior to submitting. We do, however, recommend that the SEAL coordinator save the original copy of the end of year data form with student names for their own records. They'll delete those first three white columns and then use the save as function of Excel to create a version to submit to NICID without that identifying information. So why might you keep those first three white columns for your own records? Well, you may find that there's an error. Um, after submitting the form, or we may call you and say we have a question, and it'll be a lot easier if you can reference that line based on student name. The blue section of the end of your data tab has to do with student demographic information, and there are six columns that need to be filled out. The nicest ID number, gender, race, ethnicity, graduation month, and student age. 
you'll notice that the first form or the first column is the NICES ID number. This is a 10 digit number that is issued by the state. And as Anna said, it is not the internal student ID number used by your school, which is most likely a six digit number. Gender is a pull down and you simply select female, male, or non-binary. Race is also a pull down. You will select one of the six race designations with which the student most identifies. Ethnicity is a yes, no column. You pull it down and choose whichever is applicable to the student, either yes, the student is of Hispanic ethnicity or no, they are not. The graduation month is also a pull down. You can choose January, June, or August. And remember, you're only reporting seniors who are graduating with the seal of biliteracy, so you wouldn't be selecting a year because by definition, everyone will be graduating in the year in which the form is submitted. This is important in case you have students who complete the work of the seal early, for instance, in junior year. You wouldn't report those students until the year in which they will be graduating. The last part of the demographic, uh, demographic blue section is student age. This is a yes, no pull down menu. You would select yes if the student is less than 21 years of age as of September, which that is the default, or no if they're older than 21 years in September um, in the year that they are currently in. Now you might ask, why do we need student age? And the reason is because we triangulate the data that you submit to us with other data that we have. And there is an issue with that other data that when we pull SEAL candidates uh, from that data, it doesn't pull students who are over 21. And so by entering this data on your spreadsheet, it allows us to realize why the data is not there and we don't have to call you for a discrepancy. Now, I wanna address why the nicest column is shaded pink when it's in the blue section. The pink indicates that there is some kind of issue with the data, and this is the default position. What happens is when you enter in a unique 10-digit nicest number, the cell then goes blue. If the cell remains pink, then it's a signal that either the nicest number has more or less than 10 digits, or it's a duplicate nicest number and you need to go back and fix it. Again, I already addressed why we're asking you to submit whether students are 21 years of age uh, or older. So let's talk a little bit about the clarification of the reporting of demographic data. We do collect data on SEAL candidates relative to their gender, ethnicity, and race. And we compare this data against the same data for the entire statewide cohort of students who are graduating. We do this to identify how well NYSET, as well as district and schools, are doing in recruiting SEAL candidates. So we'd like to see that the SEAL candidates are representative of the overall graduation cohort. And by taking a look and comparing these two data sets, we can take action to continue to improve our efforts to recruit and support as many students as possible to pursue and achieve the SEAL. We do encourage schools and districts to ask their SEAL candidates how they prefer to be identified for these categories. So for instance, for gender, asking students whether they want to be identified as male, female, or non-binary, as well as asking students with which race and with which identity they prefer to be identified. Now, NYSED collects data using six race designations listed here on the screen, American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian or Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander, Black or African American, Hispanic or Latino or of Spanish origin, multiracial, and white. Students can choose to identify as Hispanic or Latino or of Spanish origin as both their race and or their ethnicity. This provides flexibility for a student to identify as they would prefer. So we say this because sometimes this is a source of confusion as the federal government designates Hispanic not as a race, but only as an ethnicity. So let's take three students. Student A may identify as being of the white race, but of Hispanic ethnicity. 
Student B may identify as being Black or African American, but also of Hispanic ethnicity. And student C prefers that both their race and their ethnicity be listed as Hispanic. Now, the pink section of the end of your data tab has to do with L status. And as Anna already mentioned, every student has an L status, even if they're not an English language learner. The four possible categories are current English language learners, ever English language learners, never English language learners with a home language of English, and never English language learners with a home language other than English. These are pretty self-explanatory. Your L's are students who are currently identified as English language learners who haven't yet tested out of that status. Your former or ever L's are students who were at one time identified as an English language learner, but since that time they have achieved the required proficiency in English to exit L status. Your never L's whose home language of English are students who were never identified as English language learners and their home language is English. By the same token, your never L's with a home language other than English are students who were never identified as L's and whose home language is something other than English. This last group of student is often called heritage language speakers. The brown section of the end of your data tab refers to whether the student has already met the criteria for the seal listed on the form or whether they've completed the work and they are anticipated to meet it by a future date. A student is marked as criteria already met when they have completed all criteria listed on the end of your data form, including receiving any scores from any assessments, which would be criterion 1A, 1B, 1D, or 2D. A student is marked as anticipated when they have not yet met all of the criteria listed on the form. The most common reason for this is that a student has taken an AP or IB exam in their senior year, and they are waiting for the score to confirm that they have earned the point for that criterion. Once the student has received the scores that they need, the SEAL coordinator would change their status under criteria already met or anticipated from anticipated to criteria already met. Now, if this is done prior to the form being submitted, you only have to submit it once. If you've already submitted the form and you have anticipated candidates, once you now have that information that the student has received all of the points they need, you would change their status and submit an amended end of your data form to NICID. So let's talk about this because again, this can be a source of confusion. If you have anticipated candidates, when should you submit the end of your data form? With the exception of students who are waiting for an AP or IB score, or students whose course averages are just below that 85 mark, and the fourth quarter average will make a difference in their overall average, all other SEAL candidates should finish their SEAL work prior to May 31st, but ideally by early May. Here's how you should figure out when you should submit the form. Figure out when you need the seals or medallions to prepare for graduation materials and back out about two weeks to allow for NICID processing and mailing. You may also want to consider if it takes a certain amount of time for your school to prepare graduation materials, for instance, putting those stickers on the diplomas. Should you submit the end of your data form if all or most of your seal candidates are anticipated? No, you should not because seals and medallions will not be mailed to schools who submit the end of your data form with a significant number of anticipated candidates. You instead should wait until those candidates have received all of their points. You can submit your end of your data form with a mixture of anticipated and criteria already met candidates. In this case, seals and medallions will only be mailed for the candidates who have already met the criteria at the time of submission starting on May 5th. Now, if you have one or two or three students who are anticipated, we're not going to hold up their seals and medallions. When you have a larger group of students who have met all the criteria, we'll mail them all to you. But we'll ask that you withhold those seals and medallions for students who are anticipated until you've verified that they have, in fact, met the criteria. Again, if you have a large number of students who are anticipated, we won't be sending those seals and medallions until we get confirmation from you that the students have met the criteria. 
Please note that when you submit an end of year data form with anticipated candidates, you must submit an amended end of year data form once the criteria for all these students have been met. You should do this no later than July 15th. All remaining seals and medallions for such candidates will be mailed in a single package. So how many of these amended end of year data forms should be submitted? Ideally, you're only gonna submit one form total with all of your candidates on it. But that that assumes that you all your students are criteria already met. If you have anticipated candidates, go ahead and submit the end of your data form. And then once you have their information that they've you verified all of their points, then submit one end of year amended data form with all of the students. If you have students who end up not getting the seal, you can just remove them from that amended list. Now, if you submit an end of year data form and then you realize there's an error, please do submit another amended form correcting the error. We're now gonna talk about the first TAN section on the end of your data tab. This is where you will indicate which of the English criteria your successful SEAL candidates have met. And there's a couple of different columns all labeled by the criteria. 1A is your English Regents greater than 80%. This is a pull down menu. You simply pull it down and you select an X in the box to indicate the student has met that criteria. Students can also do 1A, which is two Regents exams other than ELA greater than 75, not in translation. This is also a pull down menu where you select an X if the student meets the criteria. Remember that two Regents exams other than ELA greater than 75 is only for English language learners. So any X that you have in that column should correspond to an English language learner status of current or uh, ever L. Students who are never L's may not use this point towards the seal. 1B is also a pull down menu where you select an X if the student has received a score of 290 or better on the NICE slot. Again, these are only for English language learners, current or former. It's important that you reference to double check and make sure that whenever you've entered an X for either of these two columns, that the L status says current L or former L. A quick reminder that in order to use 1B as a point for the seal of biliteracy, the nicest slot score that the student received must have been received while the student was in high school. So an L who took the nicest slot in fifth grade and got a 290 may not use that as a point towards the seal of biliteracy because the exam was not taken while they were in high school. There are a couple of additional criteria that we'd like to talk about. The first is 1C, 11th and 12th grade ELA course is greater than 85. Schools may calculate this 85 as either an 85 in each course, 11th and 12th, or a two-year average of 85 or better. And we don't need you to wait until the end of the senior year to calculate the average. You can use the first seven quarters, that is, the four quarters of the uh, 11th grade year and the first three quarters of the senior year. If the average is well above 85, there's no issue. You can simply mark an X in the box that the student has met the criteria. If, however, the average is 84 point something, um, or you're concerned that the fourth quarter average is gonna tank the overall yearly average, what you can simply do is mark the student as anticipated and then wait for that fourth quarter average to come in. But for most students, their grade average for the seven quarters is ample to indicate the student has met the criteria. Now, the next uh, option is 1D. We're going to talk about that in the next slide. So I'm going to move on to 1E, the culminating projects. Again, this is a simple pull down. So you simply put an X in that column when the student has met the criteria. This culminating project is worth two points. And because of this, we have a large number of students, about 70% of our SEAL earners complete a project in English. 
So for the 1D criteria, you'll see there are two columns, English Assessment 1 and English Assessment 2. This is because we allow students to earn up to two points for taking two different English assessments and earning the minimum required score. These exams are listed in the SEAL handbook, which is updated yearly. On the screen, you can see we have the Apple exam in English, two AP exams, one on English language and one on English literature, two IB exams, again, one on literature, one on language and literature, the Stamp 4S exam in English, and the Test of English as a Foreign Language or the TOEFL exam. You simply click into the cell in the column on English assessment. You'll see it's a pull down menu, but instead of putting an X, you're actually going to select the name of the exam the student took and earned the score on. Now, again, there's two columns. You're only going to use the second column if students took a second exam. So please don't repeat the name of the same exam in both columns. We want to point out again that certain exams require a significant amount of time before you receive the score when it, the exam is taken in the senior year. In particular, AP and IB exams can be used for the seal of biliteracy, but when they're taken in the student's senior year, generally those scores are not available until early July. What's problematic about this is that the students graduate in June. And so you would be unable to mark the student as criteria already met at the time that you're submitting the end of your data form, which means that you're not going to have the seal and the medallion to distribute to the student to have at graduation. In fact, what's going to have to happen if the students absolutely need these points is you're gonna mark them as anticipated. Then once you get the scores, you're gonna submit an end of year, an amended end of year data form and then we will send you the seals and medallions. Now, if you have a limited number of students who are anticipated, I mentioned before, we will send those seals and medallions out, but we ask that you withhold those seals and medallions from your anticipated candidates until you verified those scores. For this reason, we often encourage schools to see if students may have earned the points they need in English without AP or IB exams. For instance, students could get an 80 or better on the ELA exam, they could get an 85 or better in their 11th and 12th grade ELA courses, and they could do a project, and that earns them four points, which is more than they actually need to get the seal. So if you have students who are also taking AP and IB exams, but they don't need the points, there's no reason to put them on the form. You should only list them if they actually need them in order to get those three points. Again, a reminder that the TOEFL exam is only for current or ever English language learners and never else cannot use this exam to earn a point towards the English criteria. Okay, um, so let's move on to the gray section that follows this English criteria section. And you can see on the screenshot that we've filled in some of the criteria for some of our students. So there are two gray columns that follow the TAN section. The first one's called Raw Points English, and the second one's called English Criteria Met. Remember that the gray cells are locked. That is, you cannot change them. These cells auto-calculate given the information that you enter in the TAN section. So if we take a look at the first student, they got a point from the ELA regions greater than 80, they get a point for their 11th and 12th grade ELA courses being 85 or better, and they got at least the minimum score on the AP English language exam. That's one, two, three points. Notice that the computer has automatically calculated that the student has earned three points, and that means that the student has now met the English criteria, it says yes. If we look at the last student here, They've earned one point by getting an 80 or better on the ELA Regents, another point by getting an 85 or better in their 11th and 12th grade ELA course. But that's only two points, and therefore the computer has indicated that no, the English criteria has not yet been met. The solution in this instance is to find a way in which the student can earn at least another point, for instance, by doing a culminating project.
if we were to enter in an X into this cell for the last student for the culminating project, we would see that the points would then add up to four and that English criteria met cell, which now says no, would change to yes. Now there is a second tan section on the end of your data form. This works the same way the first section did for English, but now this is for the world language criteria. Again, you're only going to put successful skill candidates on this form. So let's go through these different criteria. 2A is when a student gets an 85 or better in the Checkpoint C course. A Checkpoint C course is any year long course beyond Checkpoint B that is aligned to the world language standards. Now, unlike English courses, which require two years with an 85 or better, 11th and 12th grade, students only need an 85 in one year of a Checkpoint C course. This is generally junior or senior year. Students may not earn two points for getting an 85 or better in two Checkpoint C courses, but they can get an 85 either in uh, Spanish 4, um, a dual enrollment course in junior year, an AP course, an IB course, and if they don't get it that first year of Checkpoint C, they can always try again to get an 85 in their senior year. Again, the average for the year-long Checkpoint C course can be calculated from the first three quarters. If the average is not quite 85, or if there's some kind of concern that the student will dip below that 85 due to a final quarter, you can simply mark the student as anticipated and withhold the seal or medallion until that fourth quarter grade has been averaged in to determine if the student met the criteria. 2B is a transcript from outside the US. It's a fairly infrequent criteria, but it is an option. These are pull down menus. You simply pull it down and you put an X in the box if the student has met the criteria. 2C is a home language arts course with an 85 or better from a bilingual program. Again, it's a pull down menu with an X. And 2D is the required score on approved Checkpoint C assessment. Just like for English, these are pull down menus where you will select the actual name of the exam on which the student received at least the minimum score. Now, the culminating project is worth two points. Historically, about 95% of SEAL earners complete a culminating project in a world language. We want to remind you that we have exams in many different languages and that these are listed in the SEAL handbook and updated yearly. We're not going to go through each exam, but we are going to highlight. Remember that the scores for AP and IB exams when, are, when they're taken in the student's senior year may not be available until early July. And if this is the case, the student needs to be marked as anticipated until those scores are verified. So again, the assessments have two columns for 2D because students can earn two points by taking two separate assessments and earning at least the minimum required score. Just like for English, we ask that you do not repeat the same assessment in the two columns. You enter it in the first column and only if the student takes a second uh, checkpoint C assessment do you enter anything in the second column. Please note that there is a scroll bar because all of the, the test options are not available on this first screen, but you use the scroll bar to scroll down to see all of the exams available. Now we do have a number of language specific exams, including the SLPI for ASL, as well as the test of Chinese as a foreign language, the DELF for French, the Certificat Deutsch for German, the Alira for Latin, the Dele for Spanish. Now, the last option is called the oral interview, and we want to be very careful with this. The oral interview is a very rare option and is only available when there is no Checkpoint C test approved in the SEAL handbook. This would never be the case for languages that have an exam like Spanish, French, Italian, German, Latin, and Mandarin. But when the student speaks a rare language that is not taught in school and does not have an available assessment listed in the handbook, the student can earn a point for Criterion 2D by a qualified adult speaker of the language 
conducting an oral interview with the student on any topic. The student earns the point by reaching at least intermediate mid on the interpersonal communication rubric. Again, the oral interview is only allowed when there is no approved checkpoint C assessment in a language listed in the handbook. I wanna say a few words about the culminating project in a world language because so many of our students choose to do this, about 95%. The culminating projects are presented and evaluated by the school using a NICID approved rubric. And there are three categories of languages. Category one, two are languages that are closer to English and that generally use a Roman-based alphabet. These are our most commonly taught languages like French, Spanish, Italian, German, um, Portuguese. It also includes some languages that are not as commonly taught like Haitian Creole, Swedish, Afrikaans. You can see a full list of these in our proficiency ranges on our website. Now, all other languages, except for those first few that I mentioned, are considered category three, four. These are languages that are further away from English or that don't use a Roman-based alphabet. So languages like Arabic, Greek, Hebrew, Russian, these all use a non-Roman-based alphabet. Our character languages, such as Mandarin, Japanese, Korean, these are all category three, four. Our indigenous languages like Tuscarora and Seneca, these are category three, four. The final category of languages are classical. These generally are Latin, ancient Greek, and ancient Hebrew. Now, each category of language has its own proficiency target. Category one, two languages, again, which are our most commonly taught languages, use intermediate high as the required level of proficiency to earn the seal. And you can see a screenshot of the interpretive rubric here on the left. All of these rubrics are available on our website, but they're also linked here on the presentation. Category three, four languages require intermediate mid in all modalities and classical languages require intermediate high for interpretive reading only. So let's go back and refresh our memory about these gray auto calculate fields that follow the second tan section, which is where you enter the information for your world languages. Remember that these gray cells are locked and cannot be changed. They auto calculate given the information that you enter in the tan cells. There are the same two columns that we saw for English, raw points in world language and world language criteria met, but we also have this third column now called seal of biliteracy criteria met, which we'll talk about in just a moment. So notice that for these five students, we've entered some sample criteria. The first student completed their seal in Spanish, and they got a point by getting an 85 or better in their HLA course, and they completed the project. Notice that the computer has added up the points. The student earned three points, and they therefore met the world language criteria. Let's look at this last student, though, who completed work in French. They got an 85 or better in their Checkpoint C course, and they took the AP French language exam and got a four or better. Notice that this is only two points, so the student has not yet met the seal of uh, the world language criteria. Now, what is interesting is that this last grade column combines the English criteria met and the world language criteria met. And it says only if both of those two say yes, will I also say that yes, the whole seal of biliteracy criteria has met. So this is a signal to you SEAL coordinators. You're gonna to want to make sure that this SEAL of Biliteracy Criteria Met column says yes for all of your candidates. If it says no, this is a signal to you that there is something missing, either in the English side or the world language side that needs to be corrected before you submit the form. Just a reminder that the green column must be filled in with the world language in which the student is earning the SEAL. This is a world language other than English, because remember, all students must complete the seal in English, and those are done in the prior TAN section. Please fill in the name of the language in the green column. 
Now there are additional TAN sections for additional world languages. Yes, students can earn the seal of biliteracy in more than one world language. So we have a second world language set of TAN sections. We have a third world language and we have a fourth because believe it or not, two students in New York State history have earned the seal of biliteracy in English and four different world languages. If your student is only earning the seal in English and one world language, you're going to leave these sections blank. If you happen to have some students who are achieving this distinction, though, you would fill in these sections in the same way you did the prior section. Last year, we had 256 students earn the seal in two world languages in addition to English. We had 11 students do this with three world languages in addition to English, and as I mentioned, we had our second student earn the seal in four world languages in addition to English. Again, the general rule is in order to earn the seal in a language, the student needs to earn three points in each language. Now we do have a final verification of seals earned if we go all the way back to that first gray column on the end of your data form tab. It's labeled total number of students or seals earned by the student. This is an auto calculate field that counts the number of seals that each student earns. Now, most students will only earn a single seal. So this field will display a one. Students who earn the seal in English and multiple world language will display the number of world languages in which the student has earned the seal. So take a look at these two students down below. The student here in this last row has earned one seal. The student in the first row has earned two seals. Again, you can't change this field. It automatically calculates. Now, sometimes this field will say zero, even if you've entered in all of the information and students have uh, earned all the points that they need. So why does it say zero? Because this computer will only display a number if you've indicated that the student has already met the criteria. Notice that if it says zero, it probably is because that criteria already met column still says anticipated. If this is the case, it will continue to display zero until you change the student's status to criteria already met. So we have a couple of helpful hints for you as we close up this webinar. The first one is that the end of your data form is only for successful candidates. We do not collect data on students who attempt the seal, but don't actually earn it. So don't enter data for unsuccessful seal candidates on this form. It is okay to track all of your candidates on the form, and then you would remove students who are unsuccessful before you submit the form to NYSED. Now, please be aware that the form is locked so that we protect the formatting of it. And one of the things you won't be able to do is to delete an entire row. And so this can be a source of frustration if you're using this form to track students and you have an unsuccessful candidate that you need to remove before you submit the form. While you can't delete an entire row, you can go to the first cell in the row you wanna get rid of and hit delete and then tab delete, tab delete all the way across the row until that student's information is removed. Another helpful hint is to make sure to save and print a copy of the final end of your data form, not only for your records, but you're also going to want to make sure that you send a copy of this form to your head of counseling and the district data coordinator. We covered this in the beginning of the webinar, but we can't stress how important it is to make sure that there is somebody at the district over the summer who has access to this form. We generally have a number of schools that we need to contact over the summer because of some type of discrepancy. And if you are a SEAL coordinator who is a 10 month employee and you don't work in the summer, it becomes difficult to then resolve the discrepancy unless there's another employee at the district who has this form. We encourage you to make a copy of the end of your data form for each SEAL cohort, meaning each class of graduating students to track student progress towards the SEAL. So you could have your incoming class of ninth graders and begin tracking those students in terms of the points they've already earned, 
Uh, it's great for recruitment purposes. And this is especially important for students who are current and former L's who may not be taking a world language course at your school. It's also important for heritage language speakers because those students can be traditionally difficult to identify as they wouldn't necessarily have an L status and they wouldn't necessarily be in a world language course. So we have an exciting opportunity to share with you today that we're making public immediately after this webinar. And it's called the End of Year Data Challenge. This is a multi-round online game for SEAL coordinators to practice the knowledge and skills that are necessary to understand the criterion to earn the seal of biliteracy. And what this is, is a multi-part game online where you are given a scenario. So let's take a look at this sample screenshot below. Here's a scenario. It is scenario number one, and it gives you the student's nicest number and tells you a little bit about the student. We know they're a 12th grader, they're white, but of Hispanic ethnicity. They're a former L, and they're doing the seal in English and Spanish. Spanish is the student's home language. It then go on, goes on to give you how the student has earned various points. Now, the way the game works is you will click on a link for the quiz associated with the scenario, and you will answer questions like, uh, what is the student's nicest number? What is their race? Uh, how did they get their points? And you will then submit the quiz. The questions on the quiz are either fill-ins, multiple choice, or check all that apply. And the answer of the questions actually mimic the order in which the data is entered on the end of your data form. The results for the quiz are released immediately after you submit it. If you get all the questions correct, you get an email of congratulations and you get the next scenario. And so the only way to get to the next round is to answer all the questions correctly on the prior round. Now, if you got some questions incorrect, those questions are displayed. You don't get the correct answer, but you're told that the question was not answered correctly. And you can retake the same quiz as many times as you would like until you get the correct answer. So in this first part of the end of your data challenge, there are 10 rounds. So 10 different scenarios, 10 quizzes. Each subsequent scenario is only released to you via a link that you get in an email if you get the prior quiz completely correct. And once you finish 10 rounds, you can get a CTLE certificate for an hour worth of professional development as well as a digital badge. Now, ordinarily, we would do this right during the session. As I mentioned, this is an ongoing challenge with multiple parts. Each part has 10 rounds. We will be developing multiple parts in the future. And upon successfully completing all rounds in part one, you'll get a certificate documenting one hour of CTLE credits. You only receive the link to the next round or scenario once you've gotten a perfect score on the prior rounds quiz, but you can take the quizzes as many times as you want. I hope that we were able to address all of the goals for today's session. I wanna remind you that we also have the SEAL Guidance Toolkit and in particular, module eight of this toolkit references completing the end of your data form. Now we do want to make sure that you know that this toolkit was developed very early on in the seal of biliteracy process, and we have made some updates to this process. So while the modules are generally a good guide to roll out a seal program, uh, we do encourage you to reference the webinars which have the most updated information. Speaking of those webinars, we have quite a few that we've offered this year. On the screen, you can see our eight prior webinars, all of which are available as recordings. And you can earn credit for watching those recordings by taking the associate post assessment and earning a score of at least seven out of 10. We encourage you to consider joining the SEAL Forum. This is a voluntary group of SEAL of Biliteracy coordinators. We meet virtually once a month 
Uh, we offer guidance and support on the SEAL, as well as the opportunity for you to network with other SEAL coordinators across the state. Attendance is completely voluntary, and you receive CTLE credit for any of the meetings that you attend. They are one hour offered via Zoom, and they take place once a month from September to June. The join link is available on our website as it is on this presentation. Now, we also want to encourage you to reach out for local assistance on the seal of biliteracy. Here you can see our map of the uh, of New York State color coded by the associated Arburn. The Arburn is the regional bilingual education resource network and at each Arburn, there is a resource specialist who is dedicated to assisting you with your seal of biliteracy program. And we encourage you to check out who your resource specialist might be and to reach out to them at the Arburn to be able to ask for assistance on your SEAL program. Now, if you need any more information, you can uh, reach out to myself or to Anna, and we would be happy to help you with the SEAL of Biliteracy. We wanna thank you for attending this webinar and we encourage you to continue your work with the Seal of Biliteracy. Thank you and have a wonderful evening.